Welcome to the first round table in our series, Learning Change, Adaptive Social Learning for the Anthropocene Transition. I'm Ken McLeod and I'll be your host for the series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, from whose land I'm coming to you this evening. For countless generations, the Gadigal cared for this land on which the city of Sydney now stands. While brutally displaced by invading British colonists beginning in 1788, like the other over 300 distinct cultural groups that coexisted sustainably and peacefully on this continent for 60,000 years, they never ceded their land to the British Crown or any of its post-colonial governments. We honour their tenacity and resilience and express our respect for their elders, past, present and emerging. The impetus for this series of roundtable conversations was the realisation that the Anthropocene means humankind, together with our more than human planetary cohabitants, is facing change of unprecedented scale, complexity, rapidity and unpredictability. Never before has our collective capacity as a species to learn, adapt and create been so crucial to our survival. We have called this process adaptive social learning and it will be a core theme running through the roundtables in which we bring together four very experienced practitioners in the field of systemic change, each with a distinct approach to this common imperative. Before I introduce our guests, a little housekeeping. In the last 20 or 30 minutes of this session, there will be time for your questions. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window to submit your question. Address the whole round table or a particular person as you wish. Each of our guests will take a turn in answering questions, as many as we have time for. So now I'm delighted to introduce to you our roundtable guests. Sam Rye has worked in the public, private, academic, NGO and social enterprise sectors. He is now specialising in innovation at the interface between social and biophysical systems with a focus on supporting people to work with complexity in order to make better decisions, design better programs and services, and communicate their direction. Am Amanda Tattersall is an internationally recognised community organiser, a researcher at the University of Sydney, host of the Influential Changemaker podcasts, and a former trade union official. Amanda was the founding director of the multi-stakeholder Sydney Alliance and co-founder of the Australian National Campaigning Net Network, GetUp. She is the author of Power in Coalition. Tyson Yankaporta is an academic and art critic, a researcher, and while now living in Melbourne, a member of the indigenous Apalek clan in far north Queensland. He carves traditional tools and weapons and lectures in Indigenous knowledge at Deakin University. Tyson is the author of the recent publishing phenomenon, Sand Talk. Nora Bateson is president of the International Bateson Institute based in Stockholm, a teacher of and designer of research into complex living systems and pioneer of warm data research and process design. She is a full member of the Club of Rome, the author of Small Arcs and Larger Circles, and director producer of the award winning documentary, An Ecology of Mind, on the, war on the work of her father, Gregory Bateson. All four of our guests will participate in all the round tables in this series. 
that we'll each take a turn in opening up the discussion each month. This first roundtable will be opened by Nora. And the question that I really want to ask here is, what is systems change? I mean, before we go talking about how we're going to do it and what's necessary for the implementation and the thising and the thatting and who's going to do what and what it even, how we measure it or how we discuss it, I, what even is it? And, um, and I, I wanted to start there because um, I, I don't know, I, I keep coming back to this image of, um, of animals that camouflage. Um, and and we, we look at that as them being in a kind of protection. So, you, you know, we have those stick bugs that live in trees, or you have, um, you know, snakes that blend into the landscape, or you've got frogs that you can't distinguish from the leaves, or you've got butterflies and moths that have, you know, eyes on them that look like, they look like the eyes of the predators of their predators, right? And so what this says to me is that, that and I think Tyson, you have this piece in your book that I happen to have right here. Just want you to know, brother, that I've been enjoying this so much. Where you're talking about be like your place. And there is a deep be like your placeness going on that is, is actually um, creating deep, un, unspeakable, unfindable uh, resonances into an, a system of institutions, not to the earth, not to the, the um, the, the other possible living systems that we're, we're living in, although that's there as well, it's not gone. Um, but, but the way in which all of us are essentially camouflaging, in, if you want to call it that, into the, the systems that are in our socioeconomic culture um, and, and how our education systems, language, uh, economics, health systems, all of this are, are forming through us and with us, together, through us. Um, and to me, this is, a, it, this is kind of like the, the deep spot, okay? Where is this thing that we're saying we want to change? I mean, clearly, if there's not a shifting of these relationships um, to current systems, the the um well the experiment <laughs> of the two leggeds could come to a short end um but but where's the illusion right is it is it in me is it in you is it something that we create together and and i that's where i want to start um because this session and the series of sessions is focused on learning. Um, and I think one of the things that I have been most interested in for the last 10 years is the question of what is systemic learning? How does a system learn? And when, you, when, we, when we've begun to research that, what, what we've found is that, I mean, it couldn't be any more obvious, but you know, wow, the, the learning isn't in any particular part of the system, it's in the relationships between those aspects of the system. So that when, for example, you learn to play violin, which I can't play, um, you know, where is the learning? Is it in the muscles? Is it in the music? Is it emotional? Is it in the is it in the relationship to culture and the, those emotions that have come through that culture? Is it in the, the, the forming and the crafting of the instrument itself? Is it in the wood that the violin is made of? Is it in the history of song and communication? Is it in the written music? Is it intellectual? Is it a relationship with your teacher? Where's the music? 
And so I, I, I want to start here because I know it's a hard question. And I, I, to me, this feels like um, the place where my work with warm data is definitely reaching. And, and also, um, I think, you know, I see a lot of this in, in your work, Tyson, in Sandtalk. And Amanda and Sam also, you know, I know that you are working with community and with 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 organizations and that that's it's all relational process so where are the illusions how is the learning possible what is systems change let's start there if you're a stick bug how do you change the tree well um all symbioses as you know they start out as a parasitic relation that's how they begin, um, you know, and then they kind of, they develop that interdependence. And I, I guess once that's there and there's a fair bit of homeostasis, then the tree doesn't need to be changed. And, you know, neither does the bug. Um, but these symbioses always start out as a parasitic relation. So I guess I'd throw that back to you and say, where do you think we are now? Uh, who is parasiting off of whom? right now and um and you know how inevitably is that going to transform into some kind of symbiosis that will um you know be of some kind of use and, and create an interdependent relation um you know from which a um workable system uh, a non-self-terminating system can grow yeah i mean what if the um the tree is the inter-institutional processes that were camouflaged into. And we're that stick bug thinking, uh-oh, this tree that we're camouflaged into is trouble. And Look, I, yeah. You know, I, I guess if someone came along and like they, they cut up the tree in, into squares and they said, this isn't a tree anymore, this is capital, and, um, you know, uh, but we're still going to need you to, um, to do all the things that the, the stick insect does for that, that tree. Uh, we're going to need you to do it a little bit differently. You have a skill set we need. Uh, so we're going to keep you in this freaking jar over here. Uh, you don't have access to the tree anymore, but we're still going to need you to, um, <laughs> you know, produce the chemicals <laughs> and everything else that you do. Um, and we're going to need you to do that um, for a lot longer and with a lot less rest. And um, yeah, we're going to need you to spend like, a, you know, half your life uh, actually doing that work now. And we'll provide the things to you that the trees used to provide you with, you know. Um, I mean, they won't be as good. We'll just, uh, you know, get something approximating that and poke it through the hole in the top of your jar. And, um, you know, people are going to come by and they're going to be, they're going to want to see you do your camouflage tricks. So you can put that on for us every now and then, uh, cause that's our art now. Um, and we want to see it, do it, do the camouflage, perform that right now. And um, no, you can't go back on that tree. Uh, that, that's our capital. Now that's our squares. We're leveraging that so that we can buy more, more bottles, uh, to put more of you into, uh, you know, we've got a whole rack of jars over there with holes poked in the top you know, uh, shut up. <laughs> so, I mean, I, that's, I think that that's where we're up to with that metaphor. Um, yeah. So I don't know, four of those stick insects sort of clinking together through the glass at each other going, Oh, how are we going to change the system? Uh, it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> how are you going to change the system insect? What are you going to do? Um, I'll throw that to you. Can I can I jump in? I think that's quite a fun provocation. So, um, like my, most of my time is spent being a stick insect, working out how the fuck are we going to change this thing, right? Like that's my orientation um, as a sort of community organizer, right? That's that's what we think about. And I've spent a lot of time. And now I'm um, camouflaged at the university. I'm a geographer, right? So I'm thinking about place and. Um, how things change at different scales. So taking that question and applying it to, to where we are in the world. And I think the thing that um, 
because I think it's a re I think it's an overwhelmingly difficult question to answer. Like I, I don't use the phrase systemic change. Like I, I would say I'm across it, but it's not my it's, it's not a space that I've immersed myself in. I've placed myself in other areas, so I, I don't feel 100% all knowing in answering you sort of the question right but if I was to look at it from a from a perspective as a community organizer I always think of changes occurring at, at three different levels all all possibly at the same time and at all levels required so firstly it's it's personal and interpersonal like you describe relational we use the phrase relational as well as community organizers people if, if anyone who's listening in has heard the phrase relational meeting they would understand that this this concept is sort of um, a sort, of, sort of a ground stone of uh, how you, you try and make change using organising. It's very much, it. there's an intimacy and in trying to understand how your work, how we seek to seek change in the world, right? Like the Gandhi-esque sort of idea, change yourself in order to change the world. So we need, to, we need that kind of change. But, you know, just that, right? Like hanging out and drinking your keep cups and, you know, doing personal, personal work and nothing else. That's, that's, it can be indulgent, right? There needs to be something bigger than that. You know, having a, a slightly nicer glass because you've become good at shining it from the inside is kind of bullshit, right? So it's also about building sort of institutional spaces around yourself and they could be place-based if loose or, or literally institutions. So we used to always talk about organisations working in my church, I work in my school, I work in my union, whatever it happens to be, whatever the organisation is, and making that a space that is also capable of being relational, that is some, a space where you can go and sort out and interpret the world together, an intermediary space, a place where you can understand how the world works. But even that, like I might have a rocking church and be feeling good in myself, but if the whole world is gone to shit, right, then that's also indulgent. And so there's the third scale of change, which is, you know, maybe, maybe I don't know, is a systemic question, but I, I think of it as society-wide, um, you know, that, that level of change is also required. And, you know, and I evaluate some of the change I've done in my life where I've sort of hit one level, but not the other level. And, you know, I think it can be a way of looking at how we contribute the different scales at which we achieve change and different scales put different pressure on the kinds of relationships we need to build. Like if I'm comfortable here in my middle-class white neighborhood, I don't need to go and hang out with anyone else. But if I want to change my city, I probably do need to get out of you know, where I am and meet others. And if I want to change my country or my world, the depth of relationships I need with more diverse people, you know, the pressure becomes stronger as the ambition becomes stronger as well. I'm thinking a little bit about um, how change happens um, in forests and in mature ecosystems and uh, other sort of less mature ecosystems. Um, a lot of my, so my, my current work is in conservation and so constantly ecology is, is something that's buzzing away in the back of my head. But I guess there's, there's incremental change that happens in ecosystems which tends to be about the, some, some, uh, some kind of, divergence from the the pattern of creation that uh that, that just keeps the same genetics rolling along the same physical attributes the same behaviors something something's happened and um uh i guess it's a mutation of some kind right and so suddenly the stick bug goes from being a, a wonderful camouflager to uh bright pink and a lot of the times those bugs get picked off. Uh, they're the first ones that the birds see, but sometimes that mutation is actually beneficial. So something about not being the same and not um, camouflaging with the, the system anymore, um, suddenly it's, it's an advantage. So there's that kind of incremental change and that can, that can be disruptive. But I guess if you if you look at some of the sort of the work Nassim Taleb was um, bringing in with like the black swans, actually the most we we tend to downplay it, but the most disruptive things that happen are actually 
external big change events that just destroy a destroy an ecosystem or fundamentally change it that could be you know i think of the used to live in new zealand a lot uh, on the west coast we had a lot of slips that would just come big mudslides wipe out a chunk of the forest and you would get a new ravine for a river and it just fundamentally changes that habitat and so i'm wondering if there's similar things happening here you know the kind of change that Amanda's talking about with the, the big societal change, like Black, Black Lives Matter in the States at the moment is a perfect example of this like flare up of uh, a complete change that may, may never go back to how it was before. Um, obviously, a lot of people are hoping that. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about the sort of these, these different types of change and how maybe they factor into the you know, we, we like to think we have control over our, our habitats, uh, much like the stick bug thinks that it has control over its tree in some way and it wants to change the tree. And then at some point it realizes that it's actually down the bottom of the ravine because it's just been collected in a slip um, and the tree doesn't matter anymore. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, there's anything in that, Nora, from, from your work um, in, in living systems or um, yourself, Tyson. Just, uh, that, that maybe lends something towards the question of change. Adi, just to take you back into it and into your, um, you know, area, um, you know, coming from your ge genealogy in, in complexity, um, which is, a, which is a, a profound one. Um, I, I just think, I think disruption is part of the pattern of creation. It's an important part of the pattern. Because if a pattern just keeps replicating over and over, it stagnates and that's entropy, you know, but it's the disruptions that make the pattern beautiful. As the pattern struggles to reassert itself, it's never the same again. You know, you have those earthquakes in New Zealand and you think, oh my God, that's, that's destroyed the reef. But no, -uh. it's opened up an entire new ecological niche there and, and the reef just um, suddenly, you know, within weeks, there's this startling diversity going on in the, the reef that wasn't there before. And it's actually helped the reef and the reef has changed. You know, you get that mud slip and there's a new ravine. There's a new ravine. The river changes its course. You know, this is how, this is how things happen. And, you know, when you get um, uh, demotic uh, change, you know, in, in a culture and, um, you know, a spontaneous uprising, something like that, something that hasn't been tinkered, uh, and planned and designed behind the scenes by people with, you know, different little machinations going on in the background. You know, when something happens like that, it is, um, you know, it's like a flash flood. It's like a, you know, an act of God or whatever you want to call it. But it's a, um, it's a pattern breaker, you know, which is the pattern maker, which makes the intricacy of the pattern. And it actually increases the connections between things, you know, within that system, you know, it stirs it up and forces new connections to be made and actually increases relatedness and the capacity for, um, um, that relational exchange of value and, and information or knowledge or spirit that, you know, where that warm data sits. Um, yeah, that that's when that happens. But that's, that's a very different thing from a lightning strike of a tree in a forest, you know, or a mudslide that wipes out half that forest. That's very different, you know, uh, from that tree being cut up into square blocks um, and, and the, the, the stick insects being placed in jars and, you know, every now and then being, I don't know, steered into doing some kind of gammon uprising where we sort of go... You know, we want to have a say in the jar production. <laughs> you know, we want jobs cutting up the trees into squares too. <laughs> we want to have equal participation in the destruction of this forest. Um, you know, and I'm sick of them ladybugs over there. <laughs> Whinging, um, you know. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, is disruption, you know, an important part of the pattern? And when is it um, organic, demotic, and uh, and how do you know the difference, Auntie? Mm -hmm. 
I, I mean, first of all, I just love this, <laughs> the, the revolution of the sticks, bugs in the jars wanting better jobs putting the, the trees into cubes. Because, um, you know, it feels like that. And I don't think that metaphor is so far off. Um, there's some something that, that stirs for me here around uh, your question of when is, when is that thing organic? When is it coming from, coming from the, the, the core of these systems that are working together? And when is it a charade, a script, a hack, right? You can't hack this. Um, there's something in the underground there. There's something unspeakable. There's something about the way life makes life that is outside of, of language. And you, I think a lot of times it's outside of, of perception. Um, I, you know, in, in your book, you talk about how the old fellas can see those, those relationships that show that relationships are changing, right? Um, when it comes to the SDGs, we just look for the impact measurements. And so there's something very linear uh, going on in the way we're thinking about how to even see what changes have happened. And that in my work, what I see is that that thing that is happening is never happening where you think it's happening. So, you know, there is a disruption. There's some way in which these patterns are crossing, are coming together, are linking, are intersteeping, are merging in, in ways that are different. And in that moment, there's new possibilities. But those possibilities are not where you're looking for them. They're somewhere else. And so... I think one of the issues we get into with looking for, you know, to how to do system change or where is the change is looking, you know, I, it's that metaphor. I was talking about it just last night of the drunk guy who's looking for his keys under the light. And, you know, the guy says, why, what are you doing? I'm looking for my keys. He says, well, is this where you dropped them? And he says, no, but this is where the light is shining. This is where I can see. And that the, the change is happening somewhere else, but it's not on the spreadsheet because the spreadsheet is part of a, an old way of looking and the, the actual shiftings are happening through relational process that's kind of in the underground. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I would, would add to that is that um, in the question of what is systems change, the other side of that is, is what are we perceiving and where are we looking? I often, um, in thinking about this, um, I often use a metaphor of, of, of a theater um, uh, in which there's been a background that we have been uh, a backdrop of the, of the stage that we've been able to kind of take for granted for quite a long time. Um, and, you know, in the, in, in the language of, of um, earth sciences, that was the Holocene. It was a period of fail, a fairly high de degree of predictability. And, you know, we had different theories about historical forces that brought about change, whether it was class conflict or whatever it was. But in front of that backdrop, we tended to act out our human dramas, uh, assuming that the backdrop was a kind of a constant, mostly constant. Now, it seems to me we're facing uh, a, a, a situation which you're, you're touching on now, where the backdrop itself is radically changing. We're facing we're facing a state change in the earth system. So the dynamics of, of how we engage with change are shifting constantly now because the context is shifting constantly. And that to me pro, uh, 
uh, poses some very big questions of how we how we even perceive change let alone how do we engage with it and i'm i'm interested uh, amanda how that that kind of uh, framing uh, might impact on the community development model it's such a like it's a really difficult question in in a way um because some of some of this conversation makes me um like probably a little bit defensive and uh for us maybe a little bit agitated that we can spend all this time debating about whether change is real while the while rome burns and clearly we need a different state from what we're in and for i would prefer us to be acting rather than just contemplating in some of these moments right so cards on the table that is sometimes my reaction to this conversation then the other reaction is like as someone who is involved in lots of different forms of social change but also i do a lot of teaching and training of people who are involved in those spaces like people are people really don't know what to do right there's this sort of quite deep yearning of um what what should i be doing you know to make the change and and a lot of people who are in that situation um, they act, right? Like they do something, they act and they, they run a million miles at problems doing things that probably aren't going to solve the problem, right? Like they might feel better because they've acted, but, um, you know, whether it's anything from the, the parents at my you know, sustainability committee at my kid's school who are working really hard to do a waste audit and it's so beautiful and it's just so fucking useless. Like it's just not, they should be, it, they're just, they could do anything in addition, like separate to that. And they'd probably feel more than that, right? Um, and so, so part of me is like worries about this, that we could spend too long spending about like, you know, measuring change, judging change, are we seeing change in the right places, that sort of stuff. And then, then this other place is, is very much focused on the fact that those who aren't asking questions about um, a more, more I, I would call it a more powerful or more grounded form of change um, are doing the wrong, like we'll, we'll do things that will, uh, will, won't satisfy them, you know, because what I see in those who I feel ungrounded is that they're not building the relationships that are going to change them in the process of, of of whatever transformation they achieve. And, you know, that's what I learned as a community organiser was to slow down. Like I was just building all these social movements, you know. Tyson talks about building organic, I was building organic things all the time, anti-war movements, peace movement. Like we were just <laughs> doing all this crazy stuff and it was very fun, but it was just burnt you out, you know. It was completely unsustainable. It sort of broke you when you lost, you know. Um, and what we didn't do was the nurturing, you know, Sam, your point about, you know, the sort of learning from nature, like this sort of life giving practice. We didn't do enough of that. And when I found community organizing, I found those things come together. At the same time, community organizing is no perfect nirvana and I've spent plenty of time seeing its limits as well. But um, all of that is just to sort of say, I think that someone put the question in the chat about how do you, how do the different scales of change interact with each other? And I do think that there is something of, of course, we want to achieve global change and systemic change, but if we don't build it from the ground up, then we miss something. We don't build it relationally and sort of intimately. If we don't change in the process of change, if all we become is burnt out rather than bigger people, then we're, then we're not doing it right. I don't even know if I answered your question, Ken, but that was my reaction to <laughs> this conversation. Well, I, 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 as we were talking about it, I had the image of, of the surf and I thought, well, we don't, we don't approach, we don't say, oh, well, we have to change the waves. They're not working as we want them to. We say, how do we interact with the waves? Um, and it seems to me that's the, the, the question in some ways is not how do we make change, but how do we interact with change? And Nora, I've heard you talking about um, uh, per changing perception being a form of action. And I, I think that's really quite important in these times. In some ways we need a different set of 
glasses, a different set of lenses to, to see what's happening um, through whether it's a complexity uh, lens or whatever it is. Um, because unless we perceive differently, we're not going to act differently. And if we don't act differently, we're just going to replicate the same problems. I mean, I think for me, as I'm Amanda, I completely agree with what you're saying. So it's, you know, it's, it's a question, I think, that has something to do with also, who, who am I? And at a very basic level, that is getting at how am I in relationship? What are those relationships like? Where are, where are, what are those relationships opening into in other relationships? Where do those relationships go, right? It's never about the first level of relationship. It's about where does that, what relationships does that open up? And I think one thing that has been a, a big sort of shift for me in perception, um, And I'm trying to think if this is actually true because I've kind of been around this a long time. So I don't really know where the beginning is, which strikes me as something that is, is intrinsic in all change that you can't really find the beginning of it. Um, even when it's a landslide or a demonstration or a disruption or whatever it is. Uh, but that I am not alive to, um, pursue a, a, a life that seems anything like what was there when I was in fourth grade, what I was kind of sold as the life plan, that I am alive in a time of huge transformation. Um, and, and why is that word singular? It really should be plural, transformations. Um, and... and and that that means um, a different kind of attention to what's going on around me, how I'm engaging in relationships, how I'm perceiving. It's like paying attention to the fact that the script I was given is not the one that's, that's applicable to the world that I'm living in. And recognizing that, that you know, if, if we're alive right now, we're alive in a time of, of many things that used to cohere to a particular set of scripts aren't cohering anymore. Um, which is, I, you know, to Tyson's point, I think it's probably a good thing. Um, but the disruption could, could also, uh, you know, we could, we could be that landslide that, that goes, that opens up for a new ravine. Um, so it, it, it has something to do with recognizing that, that those of us who are here right now are here in a time um, where we have to ask these kind of questions and, and the, that there is a sense of very rigorous not knowing. Um, it's not just, oh, it's unknown and ambiguous and we have to live in the spaces in between, which we do. But there's a depth and a rigor and a curiosity and an integrity to that that is, is, is I mean, it's, it's rich and sexy and funny and horrifying and tragic all at once. And so I, I, for me, I think there's something there too about just who am I in relationship to this time. There's just, it's, it's a very, tricky and and collective uh kind of um action that you need that that can't really be led or directed or you know i keep joining these groups and it's 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 you can almost count down the days until somebody will appoint themselves a committee of that group and start sending around email with schedules and and action statements and mission statements and all kinds of things you know what i mean it's it's never long, you know, and, and and as soon as it starts getting designed in that way, it's no good, and um, you know, and and the only paradigms people have to fall back on outside of that are kind of out of the box thinking or um, um, you know, like non-linear thinking, 
what's that one De Bono does that uh, <laughs> lateral thinking, but you know, De Bono's solution to like, you know, peace in the Middle East to send him some Vegemite is where he finished up, you know, um, I mean that his entire, <laughs> see that's lateral thinking is not holistic thinking, you know, it's just like, you know, use lateral thinking to decide, well, you know, these Arabs is aggressive. They're aggressive. And, and what, where does aggression come from? Oh, it comes from uh, vitamin B deficiency. Where do we get vitamin B? Oh, Vegemite. Yes. Let's send a bunch of Vegemite to the Middle East. That'll sort them out. <laughs> it sounds like pretty much everything, every response to the COVID thing that's happened. Um, absolutely blow me away so you know let's say how how do you respond in an organic and demonic way um you know to managing the business of COVID? um so who's who's got their eye on oh man um in a few months we're going to need a lot of speech pathologists because there's a lot of two-year-olds right now who haven't said their first word yet has anybody got their eye on that? You know, how can we all keep our eye on every single problem? How do we, how do we begin? How do women begin to collectively figure out the problems that are coming from them being separated from the women that they usually spend their days with from the big, you know, collective groups of women who their cycles are all in sync together and now all of a sudden they're not. And there's all these women experiencing all these very erratic cycles and it's having quite an intense biological effect. And that's about all I can say about that. But my woman's got some thoughts on it um, and the problems that that is causing that she's seeing in, in, in the, the psychological effects, the knock on effects for family and kids that's happening with all these women everywhere who need to be together and they're not what's all the knock on effects of that and who's going to be on cleanup for all that and who's going to train and allocate all these speech pathologists for all these kids who can't talk because they haven't seen another kid for a year. So they've missed out all this developmental stuff, you know, um, and like two tiny things that we might not have seen. There are a billion of those things. And just with COVID, and COVID is one tiny little hair on the head of a meta crisis, <laughs> which is like, you know, a thick and lustrous weave that's heaps, heaps better than Donald Trump's, I tell you. Um, you know, so we've got De Bono saying we'll send Vegemite. Um, and we've got, I mean, as of Sunday midnight, uh, we've got the US um, imposing those you know, Security Council uh, sanctions against Iran that the Security Council has said no to, but they're just saying, no, we're going to go with them anyway. Um, so what's our collective action, Amanda? How do we organize around that? Do we do a little protest? Because they seem to be working really well these days. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, Oh, I mean, as remedies go, it's a bit like, you know, bleeding patients in the bloody 13th century to fix their, um, mm. you know, to sort out their wandering wombs. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, don't, I can't see how you can organize to sort that out. But there is somewhere in the system, you know, of butterfly effects where you could do something. It might be a three-year-old would do something that would cause a chain reaction <laughs> that would sort that out and um, potentially, you know, not ha end up with a massive war we end where we end up with, you know, Israel that's got nukes, Pakistan that's got nukes and running out of water, um, you know, uh, where we don't end up sort of, you know, in, in annihilating the entire, like an entire hemisphere and then everybody trying to piss off down here for lifeboat Australia because of the temporary Coriolis effect. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of stuff about to kick off. We got an October full of surprises and, um, you know, th there's no single mind that can be on that. So what does organizing even mean 
in the face of that? It's a good question. <laughs> Make it. Sound. How do you organize change in a complex adaptive mm -hmm. system? So um, I guess it depends on, like, just to respond, uh, it depends on what you think you're organizing for. So there are two types, like there's two ways of seeing change being made or philosophies on the approach to change. I mean, there's more than this, but I'll simplify it, right? There are some people who go, tell me the issue and we'll work out a solution together, right? So, so therefore, you know, they, they build a long shopping list of crises, you know, like what's the, what's the problems you identified, right? You know, there's, there's issues in terms of, you know, mental health and child development and water in Pakistan. And, you know, this is just a long list of crises, right? It's, devastatingly terrible list of things that are going wrong, right? You see things from an issue perspective. Or another way of seeing things is seeing things from a power perspective. And to say that it's, it's the analysis, the reason why all the things go wrong at the same time is not because we've got an incredibly terrible shopping list problem, but that actually that we've got a power problem and that the excessive power of too few people with too little interest in anyone else, say market players, who have clutched the hands of, of um, government, right? Uh, that those narrow interests are hurting the interests of others. And that power problem is the reason why you've got these very different things on your shopping list, but they're all sort of coming from the same source. Now, before COVID, right, the theory went that well, what you've got to do is you've got to rebuild the power of people to advocate for themselves. I'm not. I'm not here to advocate for you. You're not here to advocate for me. But if you have the skills to advocate for yourself and the network to do that, and I have the skills to advocate for myself, and I have a perspective on the things that are going wrong in the world that allows me to sort of see that actually you going well and me going well, the rising tide lifts all boats, then, then things could maybe shift, right? So that, you know, that, that's our perspective, right? Some could call it sort of a mix of communitarianism with an added jilt of power because most communitarians don't have an understanding of power. Right? Um, but then but COVID, I think, does change it, not simply because of the health crisis, because of the economic crisis and the climate crisis, which means that, um, you know, <laughs> what do we do? Oh, my gosh, what do we do? So... The first response is, let's just before we work out our response, and there are, are some people who are confidently going there as a singular response of what we need to do, right? Which is, I accept probably, based on issues, it's probably not the best way forward, but there are those responses. But let's look at what um, the people who have more sided with the narrow set of interests are doing. They have a response to this too. Authoritarian nationalism, despotism, whatever you want to call it, basically highly functional in most countries around the world, bar some of Europe, maybe Canada, uh, New Zealand, bless New Zealand, you know, and Australia has not got a taste of it compared to what's going on in, in other places. But there is already, um, a, you know, a, a, a mode of accumulation, a theory of how to run the world that's responding to COVID that's, that's worse. The disruption has created the opportunity for a worse outcome you know, for, for so many people, for at least for the moment. But it's still a crisis and no one knows what they're doing. And so there's, it's all in flux, right? There's this sort of moment of flux. And I think in that moment, you know, so I would say I would have confidently said, I, I know, know how to organise. I'm happy to confidently answer the question of you know, how to organise, even though, frankly, we hadn't been very successful. I have a theory on that. But now... I think that this is the time for the deep reflection and, and Nora's idea for a sort of a holding to radical uncertainty and for people to, to put down their arms a little and think about what's really required because we've not seen something like this, arguably. Most of us have not seen something like this. I think some of us have, have seen crisis like this before, colonialised populations have, but, but many average white people like me haven't. And that is a there's an opportunity for rethinking of almost everything. That, that kind of brings us back to that question of perception too, doesn't it? Because in some ways, underlying questions are how do we see what is going on when it's not what we expect to be seeing? 
And that's one of the big challenges of the times we live in. Um, and how do we make sense of what we see? And, um, and this might partly relate to the community organizing process too, um, Amanda. How do we probe complex systems in order to better understand their dynamics? That often a campaign is effectively a kind of probe. We're seeing that in the United States at the moment with the Black White Life Matters. That campaign is, is revealing profound things about the American body politic and about American culture. It's a probe in a sense. It's particularly interesting that, I mean, you know, almost every war going on right now, uh, every kind of conflict is, is a war for perception, um, you know, and for arriving at, you know, a, a dominant perception or to force, you know, it, this idea, this mistake, this, this illusion that um, we can somehow change, it, change reality by changing our perception of reality. And yet each of us has our own unique perception perception uh, our, uh, our own unique standpoint and that somehow that must be heard and that that must come out on top and be valued and everybody's sort of battling for you know from these group identities as to whose perception will rule them all and um, you know gather enough followers around it to force the change that we want to see in the world but what are we going to change everybody's perception we're going to change everybody's language we're going to change everybody's paradigm, but there is no change in the, in what, you know, coming from Amanda's tradition and her genealogy of experience and knowledge, there's no change in condition, which is what people used to march for, will be to change for a change in, in condition. Um, but a, a lot of what people are fighting for now is just change in perception. And, and that's tricky, you know, so I decided to put a background up, Ken, because you got that deadly background there. So I put one too. <laughs> that's from um, that's from the movie Pitch Black with Vin Diesel. Uh -huh. You can't see him there because he's sneaking around, hiding, waiting to kill people. But um, he's <laughs> he's not in that picture. But that was the first movie I ever saw, and I don't think there was one before that, uh, which depicted an Aboriginal um, Australian person in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's him there beside my head. <laughs> he's from Western Australia, that actor. Um, yeah, and I was so excited. I'm like, yes, Blackfellas in space. This was decades ago. <laughs> and um, yeah, he didn't last long. So their spaceship has crashed on a planet and they've got to fix it. And they've got to fix it before dark or we're all going to get eaten um, by these monsters, these alien monsters, you know. And but the captain there to the right of my head, she's uh, she knows some other things because they're there for a reason. And the guy with his back turned in the background there, he's black ops. You know, there's lots of different agendas going on. Right over on the right there, you've got a uh, a university professor. They used Australian actors for this because you know they spent all their money on Vin Diesel, so they had to get Australian actors on the cheap. Um, and that kid there, he's a trans kid. And uh, then you've got back behind me there, you've got a, a bad girl who's good with her hands. Um, but I think you know who's going to be the first one to die, don't you? Because <laughs> for some reason, uh, the black fella's the one who has to run off and dig all the holes that need to be dug <laughs> on his own, as far away from the ship as possible, because they need some holes dug for some bloody reason to fix the ship. <laughs> and, uh, so he's the first one that gets eaten by aliens. And me, I guess if, if, if this is a spaceship Earth metaphor, there's no way. I'm not even standing on the roof with that mob. I could be hiding in the toilet and just, I'm, I'm just poking notes out through the thing going, watch that guy, he's black ops. Look behind you, there's some aliens. Um, and I think that's about where I'm at now. That's a bit gutless, eh? Hey? <laughs> Thanks, Tyson. Look, um, can we get ready to take some questions fairly soon because we're moving towards that time. So have a look at the questions that are coming up on the Q&A and choose any, I'm, I'm addressing this to the panelists, to the um, 
uh, roundtable participants, uh, uh, have a look at the questions, see if there's one, one that particularly takes your fancy that you'll want to answer, and we'll um, pick up from there. Um, it also strikes me that uh, we've been doing a lot of kind of scoping in the discussion tonight, and um, and and we we have laid a platform for exploring this whole question of what is the nature of the learning that needs to happen in a society that's uh, facing the unpredictable and the unknowable. It's not the learning that we get at school. It's not the learning that happens in most formal institutions because it's not individual learning, it's collaborative learning. And what about, and how do we think about that learning? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm foreshadowing uh, where we might be heading uh, with this discussion, but have a look at the questions and see if there's any that you want to address. I, I think where we're heading with within the framework, Ken, while we're waiting for the question, um, is the, um, you know, in the Anthropocene transitions thing, I think you sort of wisely focused on, you know, something that we can uh, do is to create the, the pedagogies and, and the, the, the ways of doing uh, knowledge production and knowledge transmission in a time of transition to create transitional cultures, both mm -hmm. to survive what's coming uh, but also to leave the cognitive tools and the good narratives behind for the people who are coming next, who are going to be on the thousand year cleanup. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to pick one of these questions. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this one about um, in the same vein as the difference that makes a difference could the change that makes a change be not to aim for change, but to simply be in right relationship. And I never know what right relationship is, because um, it seems to me that that's got to be a changing thing, um, which brings us back to the beginning of the question, which I kind of like, because I think, you know, one of the, the nice tensions that we have in this conversation today is the, the down to earth, um, you know, Amanda, on the community level, what is being done aspect, how, how is my life changing um, to um, also this sort of, you know, other level of, wait a minute, but who am I in the change and, and how is it that I have somehow become a minion of existing systems that just want to perpetuate themselves? And so this kind of tension between these two processes, I think, is is an interesting um, mm. kind of ground of asking this question, which are the changes that make the changes? And, and for me, when I say change, I definitely mean learning. Change and learning. But, but just, I, I need to also say that for me, not all learning is somehow positive or in the right relationship or in the right direction. You can, you know, you, you can learn to be violent. You can learn to withhold affection you can that's learning too um, so what what's happening in the mutual learning process and uh, yeah I don't know what do you think should we go with that question or is there one that stuck out to, to you the choosing of the question is it is <laughs> I'm not prepared for that <laughs> <laughs> I've picked a different question, but it, it might not. Okay, go, yeah, let's go, go for, go that for it. <laughs> yeah. Although I do want to speak to the right relationship and agitate a little bit whoever wrote it, which is like, I think that there's always a question about being in relationship with other people is fine. But if I'm literally just only in right relationship with my other middle class, samey, samey friends on my block, then that's not much, you know, people, I'm sure people in some pretty nasty groups are in right relationship with each other because <coughs> they're close. I think it has to be about being in unusual relationships and pushing ourselves mm -hmm. in the kinds of relationships that we find ourselves. <coughs> Sorry. It's lucky we're on zoom because I've got a cough. <coughs> um, you all don't need to catch it. 
so just just to say that I think that we if, if things are comfortable, then you're not getting anything done for yourself as much as anyone else. Like we need to have a level of a level of discomfort, a level of being challenged in the things that we do. I think to feel alive. Um, just sorry to preach on that. But the question that I now have lost because there's actually a lot more questions there <coughs> was the question about. <laughs> probably should come back to me. It's a question about power. And someone talks about who has the power and is power diffused. And is, is it the complexity? So look, power is one of those words, a bit like change where we could like spend, maybe I'll do mine whenever, whenever I do mine, I'll do it on power because I think it's a really interesting topic. There's lots of cool books. Um, there's lots of different ways of talking about it, but you know, to give away, if I end up doing it based on power, power to me is the ability to act. And so Rather than, th I think that everyone has power. I have power, Nora has power, Tyson has power. We're not powerless, no one's powerless. But acting with power is easier for some and more difficult for others. And it depends on your access to organize, it's relationships, organize people, organize money and organize ideas, right? Like those, that sort of trifecta of resources in the most simplistic way, like I'm not going to write an article about it, but, in that, but I really do think that speaks to how we access power. And we don't have much cash, so it's our people that really matter. Um, but I, but I think that there is like Foucault, right? Talks about the diffusion of power and that power is manifest in, in everything. I think that there's a truth to that. I also think um, that that it is okay to have um, a more macro assessment of power, what we call in organizing a power analysis, where we sort of work out who is more likely to exercise power, so things can get done now. It might sometimes produce a narrow perception of change that if I move this person and that happens and then change occurs, right? I'm not suggesting it's the definitive way of working, but it's incredibly, I think it's important to recognize that some people have more power than others and that to get things to make for things to change, one needs to have an analysis of how power works in order to, to, to move, <laughs> to move, um, to move those decision makers to work differently. Um, and so I, I just thought I'd throw in, there's a whole, there's a little whole thing about power that um, we could, we actually think it probably would be a quite an interesting thing to unpack at a future discussion. But just to, just to say, just like the word change, the word power has lots of different connotations because I'll bet you people who are listening to this panel, I say the word power and half of you, half of you go off. Oh, that's awful, nasty, evil people have power. I don't have power. I'm not a power. I don't, the evil people have power because power does bad things to people. And there's truth to that. And there's also another side to that, that I think that if we um, are interested in um, making the world different to how it is now, if we are interested in the question of change, you know, um, then this question of power is equally important. I, I wonder if... Um there's there's i guess there's been traditionally the expectation if you um if you if you're if you're used to having that power if you've you've amassed that sort of sense of uh resources cash relationships and you're 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 used to hoarding that you're you're kind of used to control to some extent and i'm i'm thinking a lot about uh as we're talking about change like this this sense of control versus influence keeps sort of cropping up in different ways without really being named. And I, I think traditionally, you know, strategic planning is this perfect example of us thinking that we control change. Right. So we'll write our five year plan and we'll expect everything to happen. Um, and then we'll be surprised when it doesn't. Um, and I think this is, this comes from this, this illusion of control over change. So um, I'm wondering, given this, um, this sense that potentially power and control are interlinked, maybe they're not sort of direct, but there's this sense that if you have power, you think you can control the change in some way. I wonder in this time of like, you know, growing complexity, more volatility, less certainty about the, <laughs> you know, how that change happens, um, is, you know, is this also the opportunity where changes that we don't expect to happen are more likely? Uh, and 
can they can they stem from different sources? Can we can we use um, different forms of power, different different relational, uh, different ways of being together, um, and different ways of sharing what we know and what we do um, to bring about that change in different ways from from how potentially it's it's happened in the past. My my spouse um, Megan's probably given me the best sort of. Uh, theoretical perspective on power um, that I've heard for a very long time. Um, so she's doing her doctorate on, um, you know, looking at uh, blockchain and the whole I idea of, you know, they're trying to solve this idea of, um, you know, distributed power and, you know, all that sort of thing, you know, <laughs> you know, you know how they go, <laughs> all the ones who <laughs> Silicon Valley dungeons and dragons dudes who are going to, <laughs> create these distributed power and value systems for us uh, digitally. Um, so she's, Bitcoin. she's, she's nice looking, distributed, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, she's looking at that uh, from an indigenous perspective and, and, and looking at what the, the lens of indigenous knowledge and indigenous governance systems can bring to that. And she asserts very strongly that in, in our law, in Aboriginal law, um, power and authority are always separate. They're always separate things. So the elders, elders have authority, but they don't have power. You know, the power is in the people, in the entire group, and it's distributed throughout the group. And every now and then these temporary hierarchies emerge for different purposes in different places with different people who are speaking for different country, etc. You know, so everybody kind of gets uh, the opportunity to lead at different moments, you know. Uh, and that power is distributed. But the authority sits with the elders. And she asserts that in under our law, trust cannot exist. And trust is a really important part of the, <laughs> this. It's really important. Trust cannot exist when power and authority get concentrated into one place. So there's a reason power and authority are separated. And that's to make sure that trust can exist. Because you can't function in no system can function without trust, you know? And um, she sort of sees that uh, in this Western model, uh, not this Western model, but the, the, you know, the global civilization, the Anglosphere model, that you have the state is supposed to have the authority, you know, in the ideal utopian vision of democracy and liberalism, the state holds authority and, and the corporates hold power. And that any time in history when you see a merging of state and corporate, <laughs> then, then you end up with um, that merging of power and authority. And that's fascism. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. So you've got all them little oligarchs pinging around in there and it just bleeds over into each other. And uh, you end up with power and authority both resting uh, within one powerful group. Um, and that's when things go bad. Um, so she's warning against that. She's having to do a presentation today. Um, that's why I'm so exhausted because, you know, if she's got to work on something, then I got to manage the kids all day. <laughs> but, um, you know, because she has the authority <laughs> in this house <laughs> and they have the power. Hey, um, <laughs> I think I'm the trusty one. I don't know. Hey, but yeah, she had to do this thing on, on scalability, you know, uh, of systems and how do we scale a system with distributed uh, distributed governance models, you know, and her answer is that, um, you know, indigenous systems, governance systems don't scale. That's she's calling it. What is it? Uh, she's calling it um, uh, syndicated diversity. So we have lots of um, very small, you know, independent, almost like local governance governments that are syndicated together. Uh, you know, under sort of a continental common law of like rainbow snake, um, for example, ceremony, and that within that people are, um, you know, having that free exchange, but also maintaining integrity of borders without anybody trying to annex anybody's land or steal their shit. So you have balance and you have trust in that. And you always keep that authority and that power separate. And that's how it works. But she's saying that doesn't scale well. You know, you can't have um, 
you know, 7 billion people, <laughs> you know, all under one sort of centralized group that has authority and another one that has power, that's not going to happen. It's going to tend towards fascism because you can't have trust there. But what do you think about that theory? I'm thinking about a, a friend of mine that I was talking to this morning who was in a phone call with someone she used to work with who just got made CEO of a very big multi, you know, billion dollar corporation. And she's been trying to talk to that person about, you know, what kind of, what kind of things need to happen. But that person can't do those things because they are completely caught in the web of structural controls so it would appear that that CEO position would be a position of power. Um, but that person is completely stuck in what it is to be in that position, um, which is to be basically the servant of the board and the stakeholders. So it's a loop. And it's really hard to uh, figure out where this relational process actually is. Um, in some ways, you could say that the consumers, I think, you know, have the power. But the consumers don't really have the, <clears throat> have the power because they just are, you know, what am I going to buy? You know, Nikes or Adidas, I need a pair of shoes. So do I have the power? Not really. Um, and then is it middle management? Like, at what, where is it? And so I think that, that, that this is something that is sometimes, you know, especially with the way that the matrix factor, okay, it's the matrix factor, that, that the system is trying to self-perpetuate. So if you have people who are in leadership, influential positions, their leadership and their influence is contingent upon their, whatever their position is remaining. So it's very difficult for them to dismantle their own processes because then they lose their leadership or influence. I, you know, I don't know what to say about this, but it does go round. And um, it's, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a, a sympathy grab for the people who are in those positions. It's more like an examination of um, like how, who, who actually can stop the train. Mm. And, and I don't know. It's not as easy as I have thought in the past um, because of the systemics that lock us together. And um, it's one thing that I think about the pandemic that's actually very interesting is that, um, like Amanda was saying, it kind of came and, un and revealed so much all at once. Um, and I, I've been, I, with this stuff that I do with the warm data, the warm data work, I, I work with this idea of things being trans-contextual, that they are happening in more than one context simultaneously. Um, <laughs> And that, you know, of course, that's true of your identity or of any living system, that there's lots of different processes happening simultaneously. And um, how we think about that, how that thing is continuing, I think is, is, is tricky. It's just tricky because it's in multiple contexts at the same time. And, um, it, you know, you can try to, you know, put it out over here and make a policy, but the culture comes back and pulls it back in. And this is something that uh, in the, this process that I've been working on called the warm data lab or the people need people process, it's about uh, allowing people to see things through different contexts. Um, one thing that I have noticed was, I think, important about the Black Lives Matter is that it came after the, pen, the, the big reveal that the, the pandemic showed the world that the institutions that we have been living in are flawed deeply and that they weren't actually able to, um, would, they weren't actually able to respond 
in the way that they needed to at, at health care levels, education levels, economic levels, political levels, media. I mean, you name it every which way that was, you know, whoops, this, we are not equipped to deal with this. So everyone was actually, I mean, everyone, a lot of people were in a discussion and, and a, a new perception of complex intersystemic failure. And then when George Floyd got killed, that death landed in, in an ongoing conversation from another context. But it allowed it, people who had never before been able to perceive what systemic or institutional racism was, they started to get it. Those nice, you know, lefty folks who were like, yeah, but I'm not a racist, suddenly started to say, oh, but actually, maybe I, maybe I need to own this. And of course that didn't happen with everybody, but there were people for whom there was a real shift there. Mm. And, and I think that shift was made possible because they were seeing this through another context. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about, you know, how systems learn and, and where power is, um, I think this is something to, to think about within that of how one context, um, gives meaning to another or gives vitality or gives a reflection of credibility or authorization to another, which is a tricky house of mirrors. Cause you know, you think you can address the, the issue where it is. And then it turns out that some other context is the way that we get through it. Right. The way that the, the perception shift happens and then the actions shift. We don't have a lot of time left now. We've, we're, um, we'll go a little bit over time because we, we were late getting started. But um, I, I just ask the um, roundtable guests to have a look at the questions. Choose another question. There's many, many questions <laughs> to choose from. And perhaps uh, respond to it if you feel so moved. Uh, while you're doing that, can I just say to all our participants, uh, our 115 people currently online, um, that um, in a fortnight on the 7th of October, we're going to have just an open forum where any of the questions that have emerged in tonight's roundtable conversation can be um, uh, picked apart and put back together again and looked at up whichever which way. Um, it won't be a webinar uh, platform that we'll be using. It'll be the meeting platform. So it'll be an interesting challenge for um, a fairly significant group of people to engage with one another, but we'll use the breakout rooms uh, as, a, as a way of facilitating discussion as well as the whole group. So with that little little comment, um, Sam or Amanda or Tyson, is there a question there that you want to respond to? Sam Altman's thrown out a, um, an interesting reference there to a Yin Paradis paper. I'm not sure if people have read. Uh, it's worth a look. Unsettling Truths, Modernity, Decoloniality and Indigenous Futures. Mm -hmm. um, really worth a look. So Yin's taken a very interesting turn lately and, and a bit controversial. Um, he's suggesting that it's actually um, not ever going to be possible, you know, certainly within our lifetimes, um, for us to get our land back as Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people. We're not getting our land back. Um, that's not going to happen. But that a more pressing and urgent issue is that... Um, we need instead to find a way to bring settlers into country mm. and under Aboriginal law. So rather than trying to kick the settlers out, like, I mean, as if <laughs> we'd ever be able to make that kind of change, um, no matter how well we organized, um, that we need to, um, yeah, find a way to, to bring, um, and this comes back to right relation, 
because it's not just right relationship with each other. We need to bring settlers back into right relation with the land. And this ties a lot of things together. Uh, basically, that's an imperative. Uh, if we can't do that, if we can't bring um, settlers and other non-Aboriginal people um, and, you know, even Aboriginal people who are disconnected from the land, all the people disconnected from the land, if we can't bring them back into right relation with the land under Aboriginal law, then everything and everyone is going to die. So we need to figure out how to do that. And I think that's going to be done through that um, idea that Nora introduced earlier, that idea of like being like your place, you know, that we need to be, we need to recognize what's happened to the place around us and that we're no longer stick bugs on the tree. So we can't be like the tree. We're going to have to be like the glass for a while until they can't see us anymore and they take the lid off looking for where's my bug gone and then we go fly out and stick them in the eyeball <laughs> <laughs> nah <laughs> see those metaphors are falling apart now nora um but yeah be like your place i think is a really important thing and i want to bring that back to amanda too like being in right relation is not just about being in relation you know with our exclusive groups uh it's about being in relation to place as well uh, but then making sure that your exclusive groups when you got your relations right in that that you're bringing that group into um, right relation with the other groups that are out there as well uh, because if we can't find a way to bring all of our narratives conflicting as they are alongside each other and start to see the aggregate truth of all those narratives together in those warm places in between then um, we're not going to do it we're not going to be able to bring everybody in. We're not going to be able to collectively be like our place and um, mm -hmm. syndicate in all of our glorious diversity across that and allow actual true demotic organic emergences, which pretty much is the, you know, they're the only solutions that are going to work, the things that emerge uh, from that collective practice. Sam's uh, Sam's put up the um, the reference for Yin's uh, article there. So if you, it's in the chat. So if um, if uh, you want if you want to follow that up, uh, make sure you save the chat before we finish. Sam, were you going to say something? I was just saying maybe we can send it to the to the list. Um, yeah, we can. Yes, a couple of other bits and bobs that we've. Uh, we've yeah. Good. Any other response to questions? I think there was, um, uh, I think Evelyn uh, had mentioned uh, at this point in 2020, I'm running out of the big questions and I'm mostly holding a cry with all the unknown. I've picked up how to act from that and how to act when you really don't know. It feels like a, a I just want to acknowledge that really like the the sense that 2020 is um has been huge and just disrupted all of us like i think the you know speaking from from a sort of rel relatively recent experience of grief um i feel like you know we're, we're all grieving for a life we once lived uh to some extent and um sometimes you just need to be with that and sometimes you need to be with other people who are also in that grief and will just sit with you in that grief. Um, and I think, I guess my, my sense of when you're, f when, when you feel ready to, to be with other people, uh, whatever that means this year. Um, yeah. Like I think that, that, that sense of being able to make sense together, whatever making sense means at the moment. Um, but that, that sense that we can, we can work through um, whatever it is, integrate it and learn to, to move forward. That's, it's something that we're all working with this year. So um, yeah, I just wanted to particularly acknowledge that, um, that, 
that comment on the on the thread there. Okay, perhaps the last question that you can respond to, one of you. Do you have a question? I'll just, yes, Amanda. I just wanted to throw in a couple of thoughts, like just on on that question and linking back to the conversation about control. Um, it, there's a couple of conversations about sort of playing with control on the on the um, Q and A, and one of them is from Yasmin, which is again sort of going, you know, this this talking about control is sort of um, beyond the bounds normally. Um, I also think it's worth sort of taking on when do we understand or when is a person or when is a group of people likely to um, appreciate that being out of control is okay? Because actually that is a, that happens all the time. It's just that I don't think that we allow ourselves the process to experience, experience it. And I was thinking, you know, losing control, a good example of when all of us lose control is, is when we, grieve someone's death, you know, or, or grieve a rapid, a massive transformation in our own lives in both forms, right? And we go through a process of, 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 of longing and sadness and anger and all those things about, about handling something that we expected and it's no longer there. And I, I sort of feel like there's something, might be something in that to thinking around this question of control, because, yeah, you know, like there is a, toxicity around control, linking back to something that Tyson said, there's a perception that we have control, which is just ludicrous. Um, I think some of us, I know I've had a, I had a moment in my adult life where I completely lost control, like um, when control was taken or whatever. And even though it was super shit, it actually in some ways was a blessing because it's given me a greater insight. And I think that lots of us do have that. And actually being able to look at that closely could be quite useful. I also just wanted to acknowledge there was a question from Thea around historical lessons. Has it, has it ever felt this bad before? And is there anything that we can learn from crises in the past? And all I would say, Indiana Jones is fantastic. <laughs> what are you doing to us, Tyson? Um, we should all turn around and shoot him. But um, all, uh, all I'd say is, yes, there's completely, there's so much stimulus in past. Um, in past historical lessons. And I reckon there's a, there's a bunch of biographies and stories out of whether it's just the 2008 financial crisis or the depression, particularly in the United States, because there's just so much good writing around the New Deal that, um, and there's a new book by um, Robert Putnam, who's who talks about some of the, the, those periods of history as well, that I reckon e even if the, the little that you get out of it is the kinds of leadership traits that you can see, you know, and they're not things like was an asshole ignored everyone. They were highly relational figures who were broad based in the, in the people that they worked with, nurtured and cared for others. Those people historically, whether they're at the front of history or part of history, they were the ones who made a difference. And so I think there's lots to learn about the fact that humankind has gone through terrible things before and there's insights from those periods too. Okay, well, it's we're getting to winding up. And before we go, uh, our four guests need to decide who's going to lead off the or lead off the next discussion on the 21st of October. So um, any volunteers? First of all, I just want to say thanks, you guys, for for letting me lead off today. And I think we opened up a lot of mm. um, things that we can draw from um, as the conversation develops. So that was my hope. And I, I, I'm so pleased with everybody's beautiful input. So thank you so much. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, the, the way we, we chose the first one is we're looking at um, who has the most authority, you know, in different, uh, you know, topics. And I think that complexity had to be introduced first mm -hmm. and that, uh, that, that way of relating that relatedness. And so I think we chose Nora for that because she's, you know, mm -hmm. I think of her in, as an elder in this field. And, you know, that's why I, sometimes I find myself calling her auntie, um, cause of who she is. She has that authority there. Um, and, uh, it is important to make those relations. We need to be grounded in that, but we can't just be doing that and looking at perception. I think the most important 
thing then is to look at condition and to act upon that. And there's really only one of us here who's done that with any kind of effectiveness and she's uh, damaged herself and her life for it. And, um, you know, I think, you know, usually in, in such spaces, uh, women do carry the authority. Um, and so I, I would, um, I'd nominate Amanda to go next just because she has that authority of, you know, being someone who acts and, uh, <laughs> and acts with very little regard for her personal safety or advancement. <laughs> yeah. Um, I absolutely second that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it looks like the numbers are with you, Amanda. <laughs> As I as I would have said in the trades hall. <laughs> yeah, but happy to to um, to go ahead. I'll have a think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Amanda will lead off the next discussion. It'll be on the twenty first of October. On the seventh of October, we'll have uh, just an open forum with whoever wants to join in, and uh, pick up some of the questions that emerged today. And I'd like to thank uh, Nora for uh, 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 for stirring the possum as, as we say <laughs> and, and uh, leading off into this uh, discussion tonight which has ranged widely but also I think very um, creatively potentially uh, opening up so many questions um, to thank uh, Amanda Sam and Tyson for your part in the discussion and to uh, thank all the people who are online. Um, can I just say that um, somebody said, oh, why can't we see the participants? And of course, the reason why we can't see the participants is that it would, there would be so many people on the screen. So that's why we're using the webinars for these round table, the webinar platform for this round table discussion but we'll use the Zoom meeting room for the uh, forum so that everyone will be able to see one another and you'll be conscious of a mass assembly. So thank you all very much. Um, if there's anything else that you need to have sent out to you before, let me know and we'll do that. And um, uh, go well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Tyson. Thanks, Thank you. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.